Hello and welcome to the Counterweight Podcast, where we talk about how we can strive for a world in which freedom and reason are the forefront of all human society. In this podcast, we'll be speaking to Lee Jussin, who is a professor of psychology at Rutgers University and has recently started a new society called the Society of Open Inquiry in Behavioral Sciences. And we talk about the nature of critical social justice, the corrosive effects of political bias, the lack of evidence for this notion of implicit bias in daily interactions and the need for playing the long game. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, happy Christmas, uh, whatever, um, wherever you are in the world. Um, this is Mike uh, on the Counterweight Podcast, uh, joined by my co-host, Elizabeth, uh, and Lee Jussum uh, from Rutgers in the United States. Um, so, Lee, I wonder if you could introduce yourself and talk a bit about this uh, new organization you're, you're starting up. Well, yeah, so... I'm a social psychologist. I've studied um, stereotypes and prejudice and social beliefs for decades. Um, and in the last few years, I've become interested in uh, political radicalization and extremism. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, and one of the aspects of, well, sort of another aspect of sort of my general scholarship involves improving the the methods and practices and uh it's sort of scientific processes of of psychology especially so especially my home discipline of social psychology okay so through th that involves lots of things you've probably heard of the replication crisis right a half of psych social psych studies don't replicate um so that's in the mix but in the process of doing that we've we because i do this with lots of other people it's not like some royal we there's there's just tons of political dysfunctions in the field that lead the science to go wrong. Okay, so I'm kind of in there, um, and that probably has gotten worse rather than better over the years, um, although the things like statistics and openness have probably gotten better. Um, and kind of that put me in tune in a way that I wasn't otherwise paying attention to sort of cultural political developments in the u.s and other places so it was not particularly political before i started doing this kind of stuff um and you know because the the social sciences at least in 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 the states and i think it's true for most of western europe are very very far left so then there's two aspects to that one is the skew compared to nationally representative samples it doesn't really matter whether you do in the United States or the UK or Germany. The, the social sciences are almost entirely made up of people on the left. And so as a result, what you get are a, a, um, a, a massive disproportion, 30, 40 percent. No one knows the exact number of their surveys and you know, different surveys will tell you slightly different things. Something like 25, 30, 40 percent of the uh, uh, faculty who comprise social sciences will self-identify as Marxists, radicals, and, and, and the like, you know, activists. So, of course, what a shock, that then distorts the research. So the problems with the research are almost always coming from the left, not because people on the left are any worse or more biased or anything than people on the right, but there are, for all practical purposes, no people on the right in the academy. So. So those, if those problems emerge from the left, then criticizing them means you're criticizing sort of left activism in the field. And starting about four or five years ago, I mean, I guess it could have happened earlier, but it really picked up about four or five years ago. If you dare to criticize left shibboleths in academia, you're at risk for not just reputational damage, but actual punishment. And, and you know, that, that you know, people, uh, fact, I mean, this is not restricted to faculty, but people were being sanctioned and fired and punished in all sorts of ways for, you know, for bad tweets, for going on the wrong podcast, for like a maladroit turn of phrase, you know? So so that that is kind of, I think, how I ended up here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, we, 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 many people have been uh, disturbed by this, this sort of 
censorious, kind of intolerant, Ill, at, at best it's illiberal. I mean, it strikes me as kind of left, a version of left-wing authoritarianism, actually, a turn of the culture, but also the academy. And so it's very hard to, f probably impossible or almost impossible to fight this alone. You know, if you're alone, you know, you're going to walk into the teeth of, you know, some, you know, some, some uh, faculty member with lots of allies and, you know, you're going to end up being denounced and mobbed and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, people will come gunning for your job. Okay. So it's very hard to fight this individually. So for both of these reasons, both as a um, kind of a defense against this sort of rise of cancel culture in academia and to at least put a stake down saying, no, the political infection of social science is a really bad thing. It, nobody is perfect, and maybe we're all biased to some degree, but acknowledging and trying to do something about those biases is way better than just letting them run free. And that's what this organization is kind of standing for attempting to do. And we're small, we're, we're new, we're the Society for Open Inquiry in the Behavioral, in the behavioral Sciences. Um, and, you know, that's what open inquiry is. It kind of says anything goes. So, so in many forms of social justice activism, you know, you'll see a chant of no debate. So there's transgender issues, you'll see no debate on the Israeli-Palestinians, so there's no debate. And I mean, I really just, in, in the, in the um, Substack essay kind of announcing the, this new society, I, I touch on the no debate thing without going, I mean, it really deserves an essay or several on its own, but that the response to, of academia to anyone saying no debate should be a simple look them in the eye and say, yes, debate. So that's kind of my view of what this, this group stands for. I, I see that one of the weird things I don't get with, with, with these people um, when they're saying no debate is how can they hold that position? If you Even if you look inside the, the, their own sacred literature, for example, which they generally... I find personally, again, anecdotally, they don't tend to know their own literature very well, which is which is one big red flag. Um, but even if you look at critical race theory, for example, you look at Charles Mills, who goes on this massive defense of liberalism, criticizes it, but says, yes, we need to protect liberalism. We need to conserve its traditions because it has delivered in spite of whatever failings it has. Then you have Delgado and Stefanchich on the other side, again, within critical race theory, who are saying, no, no, liberalism is we need to be at least deeply suspicious of it. Um, and it may well be doomed. Um, and these positions, that they're, they're contradictory to each other. So, so there has to be debate. It, 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 it's very, very strange. I'd just like to, to link that in with um, Elizabeth. I mean, you know, Lee is correct. He talks about people on, on, on the right being cancelled. And, of, of course, that's true and being targeted. But then there's people who have always, like, like me, like a, a traditional UK liberal Democrat, or at least I was about 10 years ago, uh, who are centre-left. And they're coming for us, too. I mean, maybe you could talk about your background, uh, Elizabeth, and uh, your experience that, that got you in with Counterway. Um, yeah, so I was canceled for doing some of the very things that you suggest in um, in one of your your papers, um, the one in uh, Psychological Inquiry, where you sort of list a few things that we should be doing. So, for example, in, um, you know, include political views in, in diversity work. Um, you know, my, I was, that was part of why I was sent emails told, telling me that I was not welcome to speak in meetings. So I was only to speak if I agreed, um, you know, uh, subject all work to scientific skepticism, design studies with competing perspectives. This is, again, this was the, at the center of my cancellation because we were l l researching Black Lives Matter. And one of the conditions, it was an experiment, one of the conditions included a what I would call a uh, an unflattering uh, two words two words that were unflattering about Black Lives Matter and um, after you know four hundred subjects somebody took a screenshot and you know I was I was done for right um, you know so developing research programs that leave little room for you know uh, political bias I mean these are again these are some of your suggestions which I mean you know sadly those suggestions really didn't 
helped me and maybe even contributed <laughs> to my cancellation, right? Because we were trying to do good science, right? We were trying to do good scientific design and good science. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm finding, and you, you noted it in your uh, paper on the philosophers, was this, you know, you, you talk about this sort of intra-ideological um, hostility. And that's exactly what I'm experiencing, you know, at, at my own university, having the gall to research a, you know, I mean, one of the things I say all the time is I asked a question about a movement, but you attacked us personally. And by personally, I mean, you know, threats and, you know, um, that kind of thing. Well, so, so I don't know this project, but so, so in that paper, the psych inquiry paper, there's two different issues here, right? There's one of the, they're related and they are unfortunately connected in exactly the way that you describe. There's the, what is the sort of optimal or better scientific way to go about understanding and studying these sort of controversial issues? It's everything you did was the right, is the absolutely the right way to do it. But, but, this is, but because you, you weren't even, it, it sounded like you were testing hypotheses, but but if it, once you put it on the table as testing hypotheses, there's some possibility you'll find the wrong answer, right? You'll find something unflattering to the social movements that you know whatever seventy percent of your colleagues are. I mean, it might only be thirty or forty percent of your colleagues, but they're loud and intimidating, and the other thirty or forty percent just are you know afraid to speak up. It's sort of hard to know that dynamic without really knowing it on the ground wherever it's happening. But that dynamic. Really com uh, uh, common. So you're you're uh, you're you're potentially challenging these sort of cherished beliefs via the research. So it's not you know so, so it's not surprising that they came after you. I mean, it's sometimes. I mean, there's no. I don't want to overstate this. They don't. It, it, you, it's not like that always happens. There are people who have been, have done some work that d has and does challenge, you know, these sort of sacred beliefs and sacred groups, but you're at heightened risk, much heightened risk for, for them coming after you and, 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 and seeking to punish you in some way if you do that kind of research. So, though, and that's a massive dysfunction. That's actually one of the reasons we form SOIPs, actually. Um, I noticed on your, you know, your unsafe science substack, um, you know, one of the things that made me feel a little bit better about my situation is you noted like that you responded with your email basically a year after the previous one. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I can keep after this, yes. right? I don't have to say, I don't have to no. declare it over no. after a year or 18 months. And this That's is, right. I think this is one of the, you know, my ongoing, yeah. because it, I'm living this still, you know, it, it yeah. has been a year yeah. and a half and it's still going on. And, um, and I really took, um, you know, took some, um, solace in that. It's like, I don't, I don't have to be done when they say I'm done. Right. I get to, right. I get right. to continue to remind them that, uh, that this is academic freedom is, um, is worth fighting for and Absolutely. I'm going to continue to do it. Yeah, no, that, that's the, there, there's, you know, I have a Psych Today blog on, uh, th there's two connected blogs. One is how to know if you're a target of cancellation, right, of a cancellation act. Because if it's never, if you're a normal person, like just going about your business, your life, you're an academic, you kind of think like the academic life, it's about ideas and debate and, you know, right? And, and then all of a sudden people, you, you know, you, you post something that you don't even think is that controversial, like we're testing a hypothesis on a social topic or social issue. And then all of a sudden the mob is coming after you most people who haven't gone through this are like deer in the headlights. Mm -hmm. They don't know what hit them. They, you know, they, they think they're in a debate. They think you can have a reasoned discussion with these people, but you can't. The people are there to get you and anything you say will be used against you. So that's, you just need to understand that dynamic. And then the second blog is, is a uh, uh, 10, uh, you know, what is, what is it? 10 things to do when you are tar a target of cancellation. And the t there's a lot in there, but the two most important are when they come after you, just go quiet. Just, you know, they're gonna come after you. And anything you respond, they are gonna use again, right? If you respond in kind, that's gonna be taken out of context to prove how evil you are. If you apologize, that's gonna prove you're guilty, right? I, I mean, if you say nothing, it's gonna prove how callous you are, but they're coming after you no matter what you do, right? But you don't give them ammunition if you go quiet. 
And the second is exactly what you just said, Elizabeth. You play the long game. It's not over when they think it's over. It's it, it, and that it may not ever be over. But it's all. But but if it hasn't over, you choose when it's over. Right. You play that long game, and I, I, you know, I mean, I've been the target of two pretty wicked attacks and two m- more minor attacks, and I've survived them all, and they are now fodder, not only for my scholarship, but also for my substack and for, for my t- written talks and stuff, and it's like I'm now exposing it. It's like, I just okay, I have to deal with this crap at the time, and now I am just, it is, and it is a blast. It is a blast to come back a year later and say, look, look at these people. These people are just, they're batshit crazy. <laughs> I, I find the same thing. I mean, I, I remember the first time these people came after me and they were like, and I, I, I tried to debate with them. I tried to ask them questions. And, and of course, their response was, you know, one of the, the canned responses. Well, it's not my job to educate yourself. You need to go and educate. You see, the, the problem as, as somebody who is somewhere on the spectrum, um, when you tell me to go and educate myself, that, that's, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, and then I'm going to come back, uh, unfortunately, knowing your own ideology better than you do uh, and, and, and being able to point out inconsistencies in it, um, which is rather amusing. And then, of course, finding myself in a position where I'm actually achieving some things. I mean, Elizabeth yeah. and I are, are working on a book um, because of them targeting us and, 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 and us putting them in the spotlight. But it was interesting what you're saying. Dead use everything against you. I mean, I've, I've certainly found that they'll use everything, including the kitchen sink against you. Yeah. But yeah. even if, even when you're silent, I mean, even when you, yeah. you know, you just take a step back, uh, white silence is violence, right? That, that's, it's not just wrong. You, you're actually doing violence. I mean, it, 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 in my, in my case, I mean, recently when I had a run in with one of these people who uh, uh, was incompetent in, in, in terms of they didn't know their own stuff, um, they criticized me for not affirming their worldview. Their worldview being that, that, that whiteness is this, this, you know, all conquering thing that it, it is behind every single social action, interaction, um, and that white people, because they have been socialized into it, are um, are immediately guilty, are, uh, have this implicit bias um, that runs throughout society. Right. And I, I just wonder, uh, to, to the two of you as social psychologists, and what, what do you think of this idea of implicit bias? Well, I know you're not fans, but if you could explain <laughs> it to the audience. <laughs> so, the 90% there's two different issues. There's the science and there's the way the the rhetoric that emerged from the science has escaped into the wider culture. And they're connected, but they're separable. So every, you know, people now use implicit bias basically as like, you know, discrimination happens, it's bad, you know? And, and then so, there's sometimes other baggage thrown in with that, like, you know, it's, it's pervasive, it's unconscious, you're not aware of it. And, and it is absolutely true that the first 15, 20 years of research on implicit bias made all those claims. Most of those claims have been walked back over the last five to seven years. There's been a great blossoming of skeptical inquiry uh, uh, into the nature of implicit bias and uh, the, the, the skeptics have um, compelled, well, so there's different issues here. How much have they persuaded the original advocates? Well, a little bit. The little, the, even the original advocates have walked back some of their more extreme claims. But, you know, how much are you going to, they're advocates, like how much, you know, how much are they going to walk back? But the wider, there's been, a, um, the, the rest of the academia that pays attention to this, and a lot of people aren't paying attention, and they just get the top level, you know, 90% of Americans unconscious racists, and that's what they, you know, and then they can point to one paper that shows something like that, or appears to show something like that. So, so, but among the people who are paying attention, once you get outside a fairly small circle of advocates, uh, the implicit bias has just lost a, t- a ton of credibility. And here, so here's why: um, the for twenty, for almost twenty, you know, the first 
came on the scientific scene maybe in the mid late 90s so for about 20 years so about four or five years ago the rhetoric was all about you know sort of unconscious racism and then a few years ago paper comes out showing that people know their iat score you've asked them to predict their scores on the most common measure of implicit bias which is actually a misnomer but the most common test is the implicit association test people are unbelievably able to predict their scores so there's nothing unconscious about it it's like you know it may be getting it something but 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 then what remains controversial you know you might think after 25 years it's established so i don't want to overstate this but it is unclear the extent to which measures of implicit bias capture anything different than explicit bias like there's all these racism questionnaires that have been around for like 50 years or more um and they're pretty good at getting you know at racial attitudes um and and there is some stuff that says well the implicit measures capture something different but there are also reanalyses of that that say well no if you do it the right way they're virtually the same thing so it's completely unclear that implicit bias is even a thing other than racism now people do vary i mean there are people who are hot, more versus less hostile to a, a variety of racial and ethnic groups but most of them know it. Like if you ask them, they'll tell you. <laughs> right? so, Especially so if you're they, trying you... to predict behavior, explicit attitudes are far yeah. more predictive of behavior. Yeah. If, you're, yeah. if you're willing to admit it, you're also willing to, you know. Uh, you Act know. on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and there's good there's good evidence for that. So, and that means it's not clear that there's there there. I mean, it it, it is it, it, given how much time and effort and how much it has infected the wider culture. It, it is it is plausibly uh, um, it could be defended and will be defended by the advocates, but it also is plausibly viewed as bullshit in the academic sense. So there, bullshit is not just I mean, there is this sort of cultural term for of dismissal, but the the starting about 15 years ago, a Princeton philosopher wrote a book called On Bullshit, and it was this sort of articulation of how people go about making sort of sophisticated sounding noises that ultimately are sort of, you know, it's not exactly that they're lies, but there's a flagrant disregard for what's actually true. And often this is done with sort of like impressive sounding language to make it have like a gravitas that it doesn't really have. That description, in my opinion, fits implicit bias. I remember I was in graduate school when that first barge paper came out where they um, so uh, participants circled words in a word find that um, were related to the elderly. Some of the participants did. Um, and, uh, you know, things like Florida and uh, I don't I don't know what else. Um, you know, retirement. retirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then yeah, yeah. Um, the researchers uh, count. Uh, measured how long it took them to get to the elevator, okay? And so um, I remember when we read this paper, you know, as a group, you know, in one of my required classes, we all said, this is bullshit. We were like, there's no way, there is no way. And, you know, and we, we sat around and our, you know, and, and even the professor, the social psych professor was like, well, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it's, 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 the, it's, a find, yeah, it's right. a finding, but we just were like, we just could not believe it, right? And, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but when the president or when one of the candidates, you know, I think it was Hillary Clinton invoked, you know, implicit bias in her in her campaign. And, oh, yeah. you know, we're hearing right. it and it becomes part of, you know, sort of the, the lingo, right? The cultural lingo. Right. And I think, you, you know, uh, although I have, I mean, I have some... Uh, we could talk about uh, the sort of failure to replicate thing. I have some, some some other things to say about that, but I do think that um, you know I like your you coined this phrase. I guess you did it. You know, fundamental publication error. So I and uh, of course um, and uh, you know uh, that's related to something called the continuous uh, continued influence effect, right? Where researchers have found that you know when you make any kind of correction, like to misinformation or anything that it's um, perhaps because of uh, the way memory works, that it's sort of attached as an addendum, right? This sort of like, oh, you know, there's this little like, oh, caveat thing. And if I have time, the energy, if I'm that interested, then maybe when that memory comes or when somebody says something about implicit bias, maybe I'll access that addendum and maybe I won't. And so 
the addendums, the, this, you know, the, the corrections, the new research and stuff just doesn't have the, um, the oomph that the original does, even when the original, I think, um, you know, was questionable from, from the start. Once it's got that many citations, once it's being invoked by a candidate for president, you, you know, it's all over, right? Right, right. It's yeah, it's just like a cultural meme and it's infected people's brains and all that sort of stuff. You know, the the, the thing is, it, you know, the continued influence effect when lay people make those kind of errors, it's like, OK, they're not experts. It's not really their job. And, you know, we're going around in our lives and we don't make optimal decisions all the time. Like maybe sometimes we do, but a lot of times we don't. But scientists, it's our job, right? right? So, so with that, you know, that barge paper is one of the papers that triggered yes. psychology's replication crisis, right? So, so I, I mean, I've been following this for years now, and I, I'm actually working with a fairly large group, most out of Europe, on a paper describing sort of the tricks of the trade that psychologists use to make their research look more impressive than it really is. And and one of them, one uh, this, the, the, this group is great. There's a ton of stuff in there. But one of them is to only or disproportionately cite literature that is, supports whatever point you want to make and just ignore the rest. This is everywhere. Yes. So, so... With that Borge paper, you know, the, it was the Doyen paper that failed to replicate it, came out in like 2012 or something like that. So you can look at how much the Doyen paper versus the Chen and Borge paper have been cited after the Doyen paper came out. And the, the Borge paper is cited like five times as often as the failed replication after the failed replication came out, that means like 80% of the people, 80% of the scientists referring to this are citing the barge paper without even mentioning the failed replication. This, this is like, we're not, this is not the behavior of a scientific field. And this is something that we teach our, right? We're teaching our students this, that you can't, you can't do that. You can't, you're not allowed to do you that. You, you right. must cover, you know, right. the, the alternative right. hypothesis. You have to cover that in your That's papers, right. whether it's your, whether it's your right. undergraduate, right. you know, like your first research paper, all the way up to your dissertation. This is what we're teaching them. And then, like you said, we just, after, after we've turned in that dissertation, it's, you know, we're done. We don't have to look at anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's time to grind the axe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, more, more broadly, this relates to, to to another point that I'd like to raise. Um, you know, there are some sophisticated critical social justice theorists out there with whom I'm yeah, yeah. sometimes engaged in debating, um, and I have a good dialogue with. And, and a lot of the time, they'll come out with this point where they say, "Well." Well, okay, you know, if you're going to criticize this stuff, why are you going after the, the unsophisticated types who are easy to destroy? You know, the likes of uh, Kendi or D'Angelo or, or someone like that. Why don't you look at the, the best and most nuanced uh, critical social justice theory from, from, from Charles Mills' critique of ideal theory or something like that? And, and it's a great point. I mean, I'd love to kind of focus on that stuff, but, but that stuff is relatively inconsequential right. in the right. world yeah, out yeah. there. You know, you can measure this purely from book sales. Um, or, or, or speaking Absolutely. fees, or, or where they're That's being right. invited. It, it is D'Angelo, and it is Ken. Right. Okay, if you don't want to call it critical social justice, call it whatever you yeah, want. Yeah. These people are the consequential people in the world out there, and they are the people that we have to right. target because these are the the, the, the views that, that are making there headway. And regardless of with targeting bad ideas, and that doesn't mean there aren't other good ideas that are part of the same family. But there's absolutely, you know, it, it, and it's not just critical race theory. It's anything. If I if I if I do a critique of some paper, that doesn't mean there aren't other papers that are good. I mean, it's like that's a silly argument. So so yeah. So why is it then that people believe bad ideas, these bad ideas? What is it about these ideas that are attractive? I mean, is it just that they're dumbed down, simplified ones that are easy to seize upon and then used to bully people to beat them with a stick? I mean, sometimes it seems that way to me. I mean, what, what do you think? Yeah, I, you know, that's a great question. Well, we did I, talk I about that in psychology, right? We talk about fluency, right? And the ease with which something can be understood and that it connects with ideas that we already have. And again, it is sort of like in the air, right? That there's, there's, there's remnants of racism. Racism still exists. It's still, we see, we see evidence of it 
you know, uh, all the time. And so to have a, an explanation that, um, that I think that allows people to, um, sort of, you know, adopt a, I mean, I know that, you know, maybe religion isn't the, the right word, but it's maybe the closest, you know, um, that I can think of right now that sort of uh, adopt a, a, an ideology or, a, um, whatever that, um, it's like, oh, if these, these are some things that I can say to my group, my in group that will make me look like I'm doing something without really doing anything, right? I just adopt right. a, uh, you know, sort of uh, some language and some, you know, some habits of, of, I don't know, um, interpretation that will then allow me to, you know, maintain my little inner circle and get my accolades and signal my virtue. And, and it's, it's simple, right? It's simple. Right. It's simple. It works as in sort of virtue or in group signaling system, you know, and, and in, so, I mean, I've been an academic most of my adult life at this point. And academia is in some ways not completely different than the rest of the world, but in some ways it's very different. In our careers, we, our success is almost entirely contingent on our reputations and subjective evaluations and other people's subjective evaluations. So, so, you know, this is very different than, you know, being a, an athlete, you know, a professional athlete where like you either hit a home run or you don't, you either win the tournament or you don't, you know, it doesn't matter what people think of you. If you've won the tournament, you've won the tournament, right? <laughs> you know, right? So, whereas with us, it's not, you know, everything. How do you get into graduate school? Well, you know, you need these these metrics, but you also need letters of recommendation, preferably from prestigious people. How do you get tenure? Well, you need to have a publication record, maybe you have some grants, but how do you get a publication record? People say your work is good. How do you get grants? People say your work is good. How do you get a promotion? You have let, outside letters, which are usually very important, saying you are good. Th there's no objective metrics. Like, you know, you can imagine an alternative universe where advancement was on finding out things that are that that you imagine sort of a, a almost a two by two things are important or not that important and true or un, of unknown truth or maybe even not true right sort of a, sort of a table like that the, the more you know that something is both important and true right you need both right then you would be you know you have more success right but we, no one knows what, what, <laughs> with what we do no one there's no standard for a stat i mean it's not that there's no so that probably goes a little too far we don't use the standards that we actually have even the weak ones for knowing how true something is in order to advance people in their career so for example if you were up for a promotion or, or elizabeth it wouldn't matter that people have like denounced you what would matter would be whether you've done stuff that is interesting and has proven replicable by uh, by independent researchers that would be like whoa right that but who uses that as a criteria no one uses that as a criteria. it's not used what's used there are these opinions so 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 we are all at least in academia disproportionately our incentives line up for us to to conform to what we believe to be the consensus of opinions out there. And, it, and because if you don't, you risk incurring reputational damage or worse, which is then going to harm your career. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at some of the things that, that people are doing at my school, you know, they're having, um, you know, book clubs, some of the very books that Mike just mentioned, you know, they're, they're, it's like, oh, you know, we're joining a book club. That way we don't actually have to address racism. Right. But we can put right. on our, you know, on that, like, tenure review thing or whatever that that we led a book review um about racism and so or about um anti-racist syllabi or something like that wow. and there are books about that believe it or not um and so you can you know you can lead a book and so you don't actually have to do anything you just get to and i think that's one of the lures also mike is this you know sort yeah. of um doing something right. without doing anything right 
Right. It's so, easy to take so, yeah, Twitter I mean, and denounce I mean, somebody or, you know, pro- proclaim your fealty to diversity or something like that. It's like incredibly easy to do that. And it's just, you know, and that is going to buy you points with your colleagues. Right. And and so th- this is why people do that. And, it do, you know, it's just so it is easy and it's incredibly superficial. So, so we seem to be at this position within, certainly within social psychology and, 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 and education and a number of other disciplines, ever increasingly, it seems, in which your ability to engage with reality is maladaptive, right? It's, it, it, it seems to be literally maladaptive being able to engage with reality, whereas on the contrary, being able to conjure up sophisticated sounding, impressive looking, maybe eloquent bullshit is adaptive. And, and if you want to... Uh, increase your standing within any given discipline it, it, it's about how to essentially conjure up um sophistry you know impressive sophistry i mean that's um, great. is that, that yeah, where that, we're that at is such a wonderful turn of phrase i can't wait till this comes out because that's going to be the quote for the for the tweet and i may <laughs> use it in a sub stack because it's just that was such a that is so perfectly put yeah that is great. I mean, you're very kind. I mean, thank you. But, but I mean, it, it seems to be. I mean, but even with people on our side. So, for example, Elizabeth and I gave a um, a presentation recently in Denver, Colorado. We did two ninety minute workshops, actually, um, at Heterodox Academy, and we were looking at how do we pre bunk, how do we expose people to these ideas of critical social justice, show them how they can go awry, how they can be used to bully people, so that when people recognize them in the wild, right. if you like, um, they're able to, 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 to resist them because they've already seen them. And, and this relates to uh, some research um, in, in social psychology that would seem to suggest that this would be an effective tool. Um, however, when we were exposing people to these arguments, we were getting them to try and play a game that was based on some research called Go Viral. I don't know if you know it, but we were getting them to play this game where, where they were going to be a an obvious bad actor, an obvious woke bad faith actor, right? And these people are fully aware that woke bad faith actors exist because, well, they're at Heterodox Academy, um, or at least like and 95% they came, percent they of them came were. To a so pre, we were trying to get them to play these they games. Came to they came to a pre-conference workshop that was advertised as this. So, you know. <laughs> exactly, right? And the vast majority of them couldn't do it. They were like, they were looking at these, these games, completely abstract games, and a lot of them were like, they were so, oh, this is, this is unethical. Uh, I, I can't. <laughs> unethical to whom? Even in the abstract, <laughs> there are no victims. This is a, it's a role play. You're not even targeting anybody at the table. You're targeting hypothetical person who doesn't exist. And, and people were that deeply uncomfortable with it. Um, it, you know, it was if it, you know, there's there's liberalism as an ideology, which would be absolutely fine with confronting illiberal people, right? But then there seems to be kind of this 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 liberal sensibility in which people just just won't won't go down that route, even yeah. it's in the abstract. So, so, so we're at this position. It's how, how do we fight right. back against these people? Because, you know, when you're at heterodox, you hear, we've got to double down with more liberal values. And, and, and it's like, well, how's that been working out for you so far? Well, okay. Right. So, 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 you know, so I'm, uh, I have been, you know, pretty doom and gloom for most of the last four or five years. And I, I do think whatever we, this broad we, including lots of people, I, I don't even know who they are, but there's a lot of people who have been pushing back on this for a long time now. And, and I think that has been, I'm hesitating because I'm not completely sure what's going on. Let, let, so let me go be what I'm a little more confident of is that the worst of the sort of woke illiberalism in the wider society seems to have retreated somewhat. Not so much in academia, but in the wider society. So, so I'll give you some, co- some concrete examples of why I think that. Um, first, the, the New York Times hires John McWhorter to be a regular editorialist. He's been anti-woke for 15 years or something like that. So that, that's one. Number two, also New York Times, hot, uh, um, publishes like i think it was like three editorials one a main editorial and like two op-eds that were advocates for free speech in in various ways like you hadn't seen the new york times taking a stand in favor of free speech and i don't remember until this that was new you have netflix 
basically making an announcement to its woke employees that they can go fuck themselves. That right? That that you know, if they don't like it, they can get another job. Right. So that that's d- different. You have um, what, what was it? Sanmez, the reporter at The Washington Post, who went around denouncing her colleagues as some sort of version of sexist and racist. And she got fired for creating, a, you know, a disruption in the workplace. So, you know, there's there, there are now some of it's not uh, you know, not all of it is good, you, but but or at least I wouldn't support all of it. But you also have heavy, heavy pushback on many of the U.S. states the, where the state legislatures are majority Republican, sort of banning versions of CRT, whether it's in uh, uh, public schools or even beyond. It's certainly, I, I have deep reservations about the, 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 um, the, whether they are just, whether they actually have the right to ban it in higher ed. I'm pretty sure they don't. That's protected by both uh, uh, First Amendment and academic freedom. And I think if anybody ever challenges it, they'll lose. But in, until somebody challenges it, that, that law is in place. It's different for K to 12. States have the mandate to set the curriculum. So if they want, they can ban anything they want in that curriculum. That's a political issue, not a First Amendment academic freedom rights issue. But but my point is that there's been a lot of pushback um, on this. And there, there have been organizations, you know, Counterweight is one of those major organizations. Heterodox Academy, I thought, had gone tepid for most of the last few years, but has more in the last six months, has, I think, become more proactive and more assertive. They may be undergoing a bit of a renaissance and a revival. You have the Academic Freedom Alliance uh, c- coming on board. There is a um, critical therapy antidote. So I don't know. This is right. They're very, they're good, you know. And and now you have us come online. So you have a lot of you. Have, you have the uh, David Bernstein and the Institute for Liberal Values and the sort of side thing, the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. So you have a, 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 a you're fair, right? You right the the Foundation for Against uh, Intolerance and Racism. So you have a lot. You have a lot of people. Organi- organizing in a lot of related but not quite identical ways, putting stakes in the ground saying, we are not going to accept this as the normal turn of affairs. And then you have this evidence that things have maybe turned up somewhat of a corner. Now, it's different in academia because there's in, these entrenched bureaucracies. I mean, the, the, there's the entrenched bureaucracies. You have, you have the far left faculty that are not going anywhere. So I don't, I don't think it's going to get any you know, easier for someone who is a sort of counter-revolutionary in in academia. But but in the wider society, I think things have actually improved. And I, I think actually there's evidence in, in some of your own research and, and others also that the young, the newer academics, the young PhDs are actually the worst. So we're going to go through a period in academia where things get a yeah. lot worse over the next, you know, yeah. I, however I long. And and I do want to get back to your, your very early point is that, you know, you don't have to be alone in this and you shouldn't be alone. And that's, I don't know if that's one of your top 10 uh, things, but find, find some friends because your friends will abandon you. They will leave, they will, they, you know, right. you won't have any. And, um, you know, you, I mean, I think that, you know, two people um, out of, you know, everyone that I knew at the school, two people still speak to me and one of them will only text. She will not be seen with me actually. So, you know, I don't, I don't think, you know, pe- and people need, but people need to hear that, that they're not alone, right. That, um, yeah. and that there are places, you know, to reach out and, you know, people that will, um, that will, I don't know, help you feel like you're not crazy and, um, and you don't have to be, yeah. uh, you know, you don't have to be alone in the in the fight, and uh, so I know you mentioned that early yes, on. But... That is seek allies, absolutely. I mean, you you when the, when you're the deer in the deer in the headlights st- stage where you don't know what's hitting you, you're alone. You know, it's you're not in any group. Why would you be in a group? Like it's just you you wouldn't. And it's an, probably un, an unnatural act for many of us who are used to like just running our lives more or less independently. But but. The, the only way to have, well, not the only way, but one of the best ways to both prevent, that is protect yourself against these things happening and defend against them when they do is to have a group 
that you know you can rely on right if all hell breaks loose come uh, and again and so, yeah, join that absolutely. group now i mean you know join your yeah, alliance yeah. now you know do it now so that yeah. you can yeah. educate yourself so you can pre-bunk right. yourself right and i think you're yeah. you're right like when you're shamed when you're ostracized and shamed i mean it, you know research on shame what is what do we do we withdraw that's what we do Right. Because we are, you know, society has just told us we're bad. And so we withdraw and we try to figure out how to be a good person again. And um, and so I think that, you know, then comes the depression and and everything that comes with, you know, with that. And so um, having a group already being being affiliated with a group already is going to, you know, prepare you by making a few new a, a few new friends that aren't you know, that are a little outside of your, your, your normal group. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what you think about this. I, I have this sort of, um, qu- this sort of question about how it is that, you know, shame and ostracism have, have historically been used. I mean, it's an evolutionary kind of thing, right? When people don't, you know, fit in when they're, you know, stealing food or sleeping with each other's spouses or, you know, whatever, um, harming children, I don't know, whatever, raiding the chicken house, um, you know, they're shamed and ostracized because they don't fit in with society. And so there's some sort of, you know, sort of look, you know, you, you need to sort of play you know, play in, in this playground. We have a fence around this playground. You sort of need to figure out how to play in this playground. Otherwise, we'll ostracize you. And historically, you you couldn't survive, right? You probably would die if you had to march out into, you know, all by yourself. And now it seems like the extremes, in, in and I'm not just talking about lefts, but also rights, right, are using the, they're using ostracism and shame, um, they're in the minority. I mean, all the research says they're in the minority, and yet they are effectively using ostracism and shame to attack the majority. Um, and, you know, even just, you know, people that maybe are, you know, obviously the, the, the lefts are attacking their own and the rights are attacking their own because they're not leftist or rightist enough. And I don't really know as a society, I can't explain that from a psychological, from social psychological, Social, social psychological standpoint. I can't figure out what's in it for society and how that's going to turn out. I mean, I think some of it is really, I, look, the, the, all of this is complex and there's different, different motivations for different people at different times. But a big part of it is just this moral righteousness. And I think that's true on both the left and the right. Uh, you know, I mean, they, it manifests somewhat differently on the left and the right. But but if you're, you know, if, if you're sure that your vision of the world or the country is 100 percent right, then, you know, e- then anyone who opposes you is either stupid or evil. So that's it. That's, and that's how you get shaming and ostracism. Like who, you know, we don't want someone stupid or, or evil with us. I, you know, I was like, why would we want that? So that's just, it's really, that part strikes me as really simple. We seem to be. And you know, you see that, I mean, on the right, you, at least until recently, you know, anyone who dared uh, argue against Trump and anything Trump wanted was basically expunged from the Republican party. Now, it may be, that also may be changing a little bit now, but, but for a long, you know, they, 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 what did they do? They um, censured Liz Cheney right. for daring to say the election wasn't stolen, you know, and that really maybe January 6th was pretty bad, you know, right? So, so I mean, it's just, it's just, the, the, the way it works is slightly different, but this like moral, this moral superiority, righteous in-group thing is really bad on both sides. I hear a lot of the January 6th protesters protesters, you know, rioters, the coup, coup inducers believed, and I think they genuinely believed that they were defend, patriotically defending America. We seem to be um, approaching a bit of a schism in, in let's say, the, the woke resistance, you know, those of us who are standing up to critical social justice. You've got, I think, counterweight on one side, um, in which our position is, is that you know, we, we, we'll, we'll try to remain as liberal as we can while pushing back in, in, in certain ways. And then there seems to be, uh, uh, and look, I mean, these people also have a point. There's the, there's the Chris Rufo, James Lindsay approach, which is like, 
no, we are going to use each and every dark and maybe underhanded technique right. and tactic that the woke are using because we're more right. than justified because they've done it for us. Um, and, and, and so, and it seems to be where we're at like a, you know, the, you know, the whole Nietzsche right, thing. Right. Um, right. be careful, you know, right. right? You, you end up becoming the monster that you set out to destroy. You end up becoming the thing that you hate. Um, there seems to be like a fine balance between these points. I mean, it, it, in some ways, it would kind of be naive not to use right. some of the weapons that the woke have used so effectively against us. But at the same time, you could also make the case that perhaps somebody like Chris Rufo or James Lindsay is maybe going too far. Although right. they have a point, you know, um, where is the balance there? What do you think? I think that they are both, both Rufo and Lindsay are at their best when they stick to things that are actually true. And I think they do that. They don't only do that, but they do do that. Um, uh, Lindsay's new discourses is brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, it's a brilliant expose of, you know, sort of the history and the, the logic and illogic and psychologic and appeal of all sorts of critical social justice ideas and, 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 and memes and terms and the like. Um, and Rufo, when Rufo does you know, like exposés of the manner in which some diversity or training program has been implemented in some corporate or educational setting, um, he's almost always, every once in a while, even those are off target, but usually those are on target. Um, and they are usually, you know, it's, it, 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 they're exposés and they're, they're it, it's the kind of thing that very few people think is, is good and healthy. You know, seeing what is being exposed, not that Rufo is exposing it. Um, you know, th then, uh, you know, that 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 both of them will use these to push their political agenda. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I have mixed feelings about it because I'm I'm my personal politics are like you described yours, Mike. They're left of center. You know, they're they're not this like far left, a liberal, a liberal, intolerant left, but they're left. I mean, I ran an indivisible group in 2017. We we at that point we had a uh, Republican congressman, and we were part of a larger effort that. So, if you may remember, in 2017, um, there was a move to over to to repeal Obamacare. And the Republicans held the presidency and both houses. So the only way that was going to be blocked is if some Republicans voted against it. And it wasn't just like my group. My group was small, but it was part of a larger effort that turned my Republican congressman. He voted not to repeal it. Um, so, so, so when I say I'm on the left, I like I'm I'm on the left. I mean I'm just not I this crazy woke intersectional critical justice left, but I'm on the left. So. So, um, the, the, but that's politics, right? When, when I'm, when I was acting as running an indivisible group, I'm not doing social science, right? I'm not mentoring a student. I'm, I'm engaging in political action. If Lindsay and Rufo wants to want to engage in political action to advance right wing causes, that's they're absolutely every right to do it. And, you know, I may not like it. I may disagree with the outcomes that they're pushing for, which I sometimes I do and not. But not always. It depends on what they're pushing for, actually. But that's that's normal politics. Freddie DeBoer. So Freddie DeBoer has this great substack. Um, uh, you know, and he identifies as a socialist. I mean, it's probably sort of more like a social democrat, but he identifies as a socialist. He's very far left in some ways. Um, but he has this this essay that's, his, I'm paraphrasing, but it's the, the point, it, his point is that engaging in social justice isn't being above politics. So, 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 so you, you can't pretend that, you know, you're above politics because you're advocating some sort of social justice. The, 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 the rest of the world doesn't have to buy that. So, 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 uh, I, so 
you know, when conservatives engage in political action using all means necessary to get what they want, that's normal politics. And, you know, the left needs to get over it and just get used to it and just engage in normal politics. Speaking with my left, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a political actor. I'm not doing this indivisible thing anymore. I have too many other things to do. So I would not put myself as a political activist now. But if I was a political activist and I was working for, say, the Democratic Party causes, what I would be emphasizing is trying to get Democrats elected. That That's what you want to do. And you're not going to get Democrats elected if you alienate the middle third of the country. So... Uh, they don't seem to be interested in getting elected yeah, by the looks of things like to me. You. I mean, uh, from an outsider. <laughs> it looks like, oh, it would be nice, but it's not our top priority. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. Yeah, that gets back to, to what I was. Yeah, what I was saying. It just, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's really not getting you. It doesn't make any sense to ostracize, you know, like you said two thirds of, of the country. I don't, I don't understand the, the end game here, except for what Mike said, you know, like why, you know, just like it's, it's, it's an easy, you know, um, uh, it's a, it's a way to live without thinking very hard about issues that are really hard to think about. And really so, about. you know, if you, if you, when you're given an easy answer to things that are really, really difficult, maybe sometime, you know, people tend to adopt that, I guess. Um, I, I, Elizabeth, they're on the right, they know they're on the right side of history, right? What, what more do they need? Well, I'm always saying to myself that I'm on the right side of history, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd like to believe that, that, you know, from putting my social scientist hat back on, that cleaving to the truth as much as possible, knowing that that's imperfect and hard, but doing that, that is the right side of history. But people who have done that have, have you know, the, the history of people sticking up for the truth in the face of, you know, social pressures cutting in the other direction have not uh, fared well right. throughout much of history. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think we can conclude there because we're approaching the hour long mark and we don't want to hold you for too long. Um, but let's just quickly wrap things up. So the problem as we see it is 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 bad. Um, perhaps it's at the stage now where it's like a dying animal where it's, you know, it's, it's, it's nearing the end, but it's at its most dangerous. And with each lash, it's hastening its own demise. I mean, it, it does kind of feel like that, right? It's increasingly desperate. But with regard to November, with regards to UK elections, the writing seems to be on the wall. We don't seem to see any candidates um, winning because of woke. Certainly Biden, you know, campaigned as a moderate, even though he went fairly far left afterwards. Um, but also in terms of pushing back, the first thing to do um, and the most important thing to do is to find a community, you know, and, and, and the woke are very good at this. They, they emphasize the word allies. Yeah. Find your allies now. Um, come and join us b before they turn on you. And maybe they never will. Maybe you'll be one of the lucky few who, who, who doesn't get turned on. Find no. your allies now just in case they do. Um, and ways to pull push back the effective stuff that, that Rufo and Lindsay have been doing, which is make sure you read up on the, the ideology, make sure you read up on the psychology, uh, make sure you read up on the sociology, Campbell and Manning, that kind of thing. Um, and make sure you understand who you're pushing back on. And, and, and finally, which would be the Lindsay style of things uh, yeah. in terms of Rufo, expose them. Yeah. You know, when they're doing something batshit crazy, you know, the, the, the majority yeah. of the population is with you, even if they're silent yeah. and they're going to think it's batshit crazy as well. Uh, I know project Veritas, you know, and it's okay if, if, if there are people who are exposing stuff that you don't like and they happen to be right wing, well, it doesn't follow that's that what exactly they're exposing right. is any less bad as a consequence. You know, you can disagree with these people. You can think that they're a hundred percent wrong. You can even think that they're evil, that's right? They might be evil and yet be right about exactly. this one single thing. <laughs> um, so, so, so follow the facts. And, and I think relating right back to the beginning, one thing that they hate doing um, and generally, this is because often they're not read up on their own literature, uh, or even if they are, they realize how incoherent their views are. Debate these yeah. people. They don't want to debate you. This is one of their rules. They don't want you to question their world, but debate them. Force it. Force the debate upon yeah. them, because they hate that, and they'll run away. 
Um, so I think these are some solid ways in which we can push back that kind of summarize the, the conversation thus far. I think that's um, a great thing to add. I agree, I agree with all of that. If you're an academic, if you're an academic, read the Calvin Report. Elizabeth. Have the Chicago principles at hand. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and also also realize these people are not who they say they are, and they do not represent who they claim to represent. Have a look at the American uh, America's Hidden Tribes report. You can just type that into Google, download the report, go to the demographics page on 144, page 144, around that point, and you'll see that these people are the most highly educated, the richest uh, political allegiance in America, and they're 80% white, which is more homogeneously white than pretty much any other group apart from the, the extreme right. Um, so, you know, they're not, the, they're not the ethnic minorities. They're not the poor yeah. people. Yeah. This is a rich, highly educated, elite group of society who are trying to tell you that they're champions of the downtrodden. <laughs> the downtrodden generally don't want anything to do with them, and for good reason. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Lee, Elizabeth, thank you very much.